Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology and Carleton University Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. And I'm continuing in this video on describing some of the work by Paul Kreutzen, who turned the phrase and the Anthropocene, got a Nobel Prize in, um, in 1995 on his work on ozone chemistry and uh, dealing with the ozone crisis. So I'll continue where I left off on the previous video. I was trying to calculate the, um, so basically the idea is that we remove all of the sulfur dioxide from the lower atmosphere by, you know, it's dropping 2.7% per year. We put in about 55 teragrams right now. Um, it masks some of the warming um, in mostly in the Northern hemisphere. And as we remove it to clean the air to reduce uh, the 500,000 deaths from air pollution each year, um, it cause, the warming will increase. So, so I'm talking about taking a percent or so of that and injecting it up into the stratosphere to offset the cooling and also to offset all the warming from the greenhouse gases. So I'll just continue with a couple very simple ideas here. Okay, so how much would we need to offset the, um, the aerosols in the lower atmosphere um, that are being reduced as we clean the air? Um, and uh, how much would we need to, to cool to offset global warming temperatures? So uh, a loading of one teragram of sulfur in the stratosphere, it increases the global average vertical optical depth that makes the air less transparent to sunlight coming in, blocks some of the sunlight of about 0.7% or 0.007. So this corresponds to a sulfur mixing ratio in the air of one nanomole per mole, or 10 to the minus nine, or one part per billion. This is about six times the natural background. So, so it would only be raising it from the natural background of sulfur in the stratosphere six times higher, still only a part per billion. So how much radiative forcing would this do? If we put this in the stratosphere and it spread over the planet in the stratosphere, how much radiative forcing would it, um, how much would it cool? What would be the change in the radiation on the surface? Okay, so we can calculate this based on the Mount Pinatubo eruption. So the Mount Pinatubo eruption cooled 4.5, it had a radiative cooling of 4.5 watts per square meter caused by six teragram of sulfur as calculated by Hansen shortly after the eruption. Six months after the eruption, so in the eruption, 10 teragrams was put in, from, came out of the volcano, went into the stratosphere, estimated. Only six remained after six months with this forcing. And that caused a temperature, um, okay, so, so we can downscale this. So we can say that 0.7, divide both sides by 4.5, so we can, or divide both sides by six. So one teragram of sulfur causes 0 0.75 watts per square meter of cooling. So the cost of putting this one teragram in um, back then was estimated to be US 25 billion. Um, and that probably is a high number. I think that's a lot lower than that now. It depends on how you deploy it. If you put it in jet fuel, I think it would be a lot less than that. Um, so this was, would compensate. Um, so in order to compensate um, enhanced climate warming, okay, so if you remove all the aerosols, the number here taken is 1.4 watt per square meter. Remember the IPCC um, report, the AR5 report had numbers for sulfur of anywhere from, like the aerosols, so anywhere from minus 0.77 watts per square meter. Okay, that's so 0.77 versus 1.4 to the other side to actually causing some, some uh, warming um, of 0 .0, 0 0.15 watts per square meter. Okay, I don't know if you remember that figure of the radiative forcings. Um, so if it was this number, it would require 1.9, you know, so if it's 0.75 for one teragram, 
then for 1.9 it would be um, uh, it, it would be for, for 1.4 rather it would be 1.9 teragrams of sulfur if this number is about half it would be about half it would be under a teragram so it would be the 25 billion now this type of loading would produce an optical depth of 1.3 percent remember it was a 0 0.00007 or 0 0.7 percent was one teragram so 1.9 would be 1.3 percent so you need to deploy about one to two teragrams per year for a total price of 25 billion for the one or 50 for the two and again those numbers are inflated i believe they'd be much lower depending on how you put them up there um and right now remember we're putting 55 teragrams of sulfur in the stratosphere um so if we put in one so one to two divided by 55 um is uh you know two three two to four percent okay of those levels now this would work out to 25 to 50 billion if it was that high it would work out to a per capita per person in the affluent world 25 to 50 bucks um compare that to um you know think of the costs avoided by doing this the huge infrastructure costs the huge weather weirding costs you know massive costs that will happen from rapid sea level rise losing all the sea ice in the arctic everything else i mean this cost is way way smaller the cost of doing this is dirt cheap in fact compare it to you global military expenditures over a over a trillion us thousand billion per year but you know the the us is over half it's 600 billion now again this number is a bit dated probably even higher so two to four percent of the current input per year what's that's, that's going into the lower atmosphere and again because the particle sizes of these artificial aerosols are tailored to be and they're going to be smaller than the volcanic aerosol and they're going to be a very narrow distribution they're all going to be the right size that we want versus the huge spectrum of sizes from volcanoes so we we don't we don't we have a fraction of the sulfur uh we can do the same cooling that pinatubo did with a fraction of the sulfur with only a few percent of the sulfur that even came out of pinatubo to get that type of cooling so uh you know uh the effective particle sizes for these radiative forcings are 0.1 to 1 micron okay but the smaller the particle we go with the 0.1 the smaller the particle the longer they'll stay up in the stratosphere winds will blow them around up there they're not going to settle quickly at all they can stay up for much longer even than a few years so we would need less material compared to the volcanic emission case okay um so basically with it for a doubling of co2 which causes the greenhouse gas warming of four watts per square meter we'd have to have more sulfur 5.3 teragrams that the optical depth would be 0.04 or four percent now people are concerned that this would change the way the sky looks it would maybe whiten the sky so the sky is blue because of Rayleigh scattering Rayleigh scattering is scattering um is has a one over lambda to the fourth dependent so the longer the wavelength uh the uh less scattering there is so blue wavelengths are scattered uh much much more than red wavelengths if blue is say 400 nanometers and red is say 700 call it 800 you know blue is half so half to the fourth power is 32 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 sorry is uh 16. okay so blue will scatter 16 times more blue light than red light so the sky is blue that Rayleigh scattering at the blue wavelength is 0.13 or 13 percent okay so even if we put in sulfur to offset all of the warming of a doubling of co2 the the scattering would be four percent or under a third of the existing Rayleigh scattering there'd be some whitening of the sky but the on the plus side we'd have extremely colorful sunsets and sunrises would be the trade-off so it's not all uh 
you know, and the whitening is, is much, much smaller than the Rayleigh scattering. And, you know, I would argue that if we get really small particles and a very nice fine distribution, we could greatly even reduce this number. You know, this is the sort of thing you try, you ramp it up, and then you see what happened, because modeling can only take you so far. Um, but the whitening that we have of the sky, is this whitening level is already occurring because of current air pollution in the troposphere. So if we, we'd be removing the air pollution, the sulfur dioxides in the troposphere, and putting a fraction of that up in the stratosphere, and so the white, it's basically a push with the whitening. Okay, um, now locally, uh, if we did this uh, sulfur stuff from a tropical island or from ships, it would be messy. You know, one, one thought was to use a gas, but that really doesn't really work. So we want to, because, uh, you know, not much of the gas would get up to the stratosphere. In fact, some of the sulfur dioxide that's in the troposphere, some of that we put in, that 55 teragrams, goes up into the stratosphere. But those numbers are not quantified that well as to how much goes in. Okay, so forget about the gas. So another idea that's possible is, you know, can we use something other than, um, other than sulfur? So there's looking, so there is research to look at calcites. There's research to look at, uh, you know, going even beyond the upper atmosphere, going out into space, putting little mirror arrays that were tiltable to cut down. You know, we just have to cut back to, to offset doubling of CO2, we have to uh, change the albedo uh, by about 0.5%. We want to reflect away about 0.5% more light. That's all we need to do. Uh, block, block that or reflect it away, not block it in the atmosphere because that would heat the upper atmosphere. Okay, another alternative is soot particles, for example. So this was modeled from all of the nuclear winter work during the Cold War, but in this case we'd be putting the soot particles up in the stratosphere. So this would, um, it would actually, uh, it would actually block enough light so surface temperatures would decline. We'd only need 1.7% of the mass of sulfur in the soot particles, um, so it'd be a lot cheaper. However, the soot particles absorb solar radiation very efficiently. Now, the greenhouse gases cause a, a warming, of course, of the lower atmosphere, the troposphere. But that means there's less long wave radiation going up from the surface of the Earth into the stratosphere. So the stratosphere is actually cooling because of greenhouse gases in the, in the troposphere. So soot particles in the uh, stratosphere would cause a warming and it would offset some of that cooling, but the dynamics would change. Um, it would also prevent the formation of polar stratospheric cloud particles, which require like minus 79 degrees Celsius to form and they, and they take out the ozone. So we get that ozone hole every year in Antarctica because of the very cold stratosphere. So warming of the stratosphere slightly would stop the destruction of ozone. Okay, so, so uh, we have a very difficult uh, situation here. Um, so the, so it's funny that, um, funny, um, where are we? So air pollution regulations in combination with continued growing CO2 may bring the world closer than is realized to the danger described by Schneider. Okay, great climatologist. Supposing a low probability of a high consequence outcome really started to unfold in the decades ahead, for example, five degree warming this century, this would have catastrophic implications for ecosystems. We have no choice. We can't allow this to happen. So if this is the way we're going and we continue being dumb, uh, then uh, we have no choice. And in fact, you know, it looks like we've already hit that super exponential phase where we need to take drastic action. We have a climate change emergency on our hands and we need to take dra drastic action to, uh, to deal with that. So um, I'm running out of time here. So I think I'll end this uh, video and uh, please have a look at my website, uh, paulbeckwithnot.net. Thank you.